Hey, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom, and on today's show, I have an artist who I follow on Instagram talking with me today by the name of Mr. Hyde. Now, that's Hyde with two Ds. I think it's. I, I think we talk about in the episode why that is. I, I'm assuming because it's taken, so putting two Ds on it kind of fixes that. But I don't remember. <laughs> now that I'm saying this, I'm like, what was it again? Anyway, so you can uh, visit Mr. Hyde's work at mrhyde.com with two Ds, remember? Or follow Mr. Hyde on Instagram at mrhyde underscore artist. And also don't forget to go to my website to subscribe or check out all the videos and blog stuff that I do. That is at tomrayswebsite.com. You can follow that. I do weekly um, videos about my life and about selling stuff and starting my own business online. Plus, Subscribe to the podcast there. Check out the YouTube channel. All kinds of stuff at TomRay'sWebsite.com. And uh, I don't know if I said this or not, but Mr. Hyde is in Ontario, I believe. So in Canada. And I love the fact that I not only talk to artists in my local area and around the U.S., but lately I've been talking to people in Canada. And that's really cool. I dig that. So this is my interview with Mr. Hyde on another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Mr. Hyde. I'm a muralist and I'm also a canvas painter. I, I actually started out going the fine art route. I'm 50 years old now, and uh, I guess I can say I really started when I was in my 20s. And, you know, I I probably didn't do a painting. I did lots of drawing and stuff in, in, in my teens, but I, I really started painting in my 20s. And I did graduate school. At some point in time, I thought I was going to be a... Uh, an art teacher, university, and then I realized it just wasn't for me. Okay. Um, so I moved out of the academic world, and I moved to Japan. And then I came back here and started a painting career. So I have a day job as well, but I mean, I, I, I mostly did the painting stuff until a crazy man from Brooklyn asked me to paint a mural, and I realized I really, really wanted to do that. So I went to Brooklyn, took time off my day job, and I started painting murals. All right. So we've just traveled all over the globe with you in a period of a few minutes here. So (laughs) first of all, right now you're currently based in Canada, correct? Yeah, I'm I'm based out of Toronto, but I'm trying more and more to go other places. It's just, you know, during this uh, pandemic stuff, a lot of stuff has dried up. Yes. Like I was planning on going to Art Basel this year and... uh, I've got, I've actually got connections now that I could probably get a small wall somewhere, but you know, it's, it's just not happening. They canceled the whole event. Right. So, so Miami shut down at Christmas time. Well, well, no, excuse me, not shut down. It's just not Art Basel. So there's probably be lots of people painting on walls and stuff. Yeah. And then how did you end up in Japan? Um, I was finishing up my master's degree and I bumped into a friend who, she had just come back. She was teaching English in Japan through the Mambusho program. What's and, that? Uh, uh, it's like an arm of their government that's responsible for teaching people about foreign cultures. Okay. So they wanted people in small towns to have a better sense of what the rest of the world was like. So they, they had me, well, or they were hiring young people to go in to very small towns and teach English in the public schools. So you'd work with some, like, English is, they learn English there like we learn French in Canada, so it's it's required. You have to study English. And in fact, when you apply to high school, you apply with an English test, a math test, and a Japanese test. Oh. So they would have, but most people aren't very good at speaking it. They can write it like crazy, but they can't speak it. So they would have a conversational teacher, a young person from North America, come in and teach culture, and t- teach uh, spoken language. And that's what I did. It was the easiest job I ever had in my life. It was so much fun. It was 20 hours a week and you got paid for 40 and they just let you do what you want as long as you were interactive and social with the kids and, and with the community. So wow. I learned a little Japanese while I was there. 
I, I would hope I so. Know any before lunch. But yeah, you'd think, but I met a guy who'd been there from 10 years, 10 years from Texas. And he didn't speak two words. He, he barely knew how to say thank you. Wow. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> that blew my mind. I was like, why the heck would you be here for 10 years and not speak any of the language? But oh, well. What was, so you just uprooted, uh, I'm sorry, I know that this part doesn't have to do with art. I'm just so fascinated no, that all of a sudden I, you're I, like, I, I'm going well, to Japan. Like, how do you make well, that decision? I was, I was finishing my master's and to be honest, it wasn't a great experience for me. I felt like I was doing the whole, well, why the heck am I doing art thing? Uh, when I finished, it was very overwhelming. I was a little too young. I was 27 when I was finishing up. I didn't really have a purpose for being there. And I was in debt like crazy, and I said, I would love to have an adventure that I could make money at. And then my, I bumped into my friend, and I went, oh, I could do that, you mm -hmm. know? So. And that is an uh, adventure. Yeah, no, it certainly was. It, was. it was actually way more instructional for me as a human being than any of my degrees. So it's like you really learn who you are yeah. when all your culture is stripped away. So you're, you're there by yourself. you got to figure everything out. It taught me a lot about independence. It also taught me a lot about how to understand my own culture. Like, I, I didn't think there was any difference between Canadians and Americans until I went to Japan. And I was like, oh, okay, there are a couple differences. Really? You know, like, yeah, like for instance, uh, do you take off your shoes when you go in the house? No, I do not. There you go. Canadians always do. All right. Oh, really? And I, and I was talking to Americans, and they'd be like, Oh, it's so rude not to, to take your shoes off. But if you talk to a Canadian, it's so rude not to, you know. And I'd never thought of this before, but it's an understood thing, you mm -hmm. know. And people always think Canadians are polite, but we're not really polite. We're just saying sorry and thank you, so you just leave us the hell alone and move on. It's kind of like a let's move on thing. And not to generalize it, but I mean, essentially, my yeah. my only um, knowledge of, or at least active knowing knowledge of Canada is, um, letter Kenny. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So I, I, <laughs> have you ever watched, uh, uh, trailer park boys? I've, I've seen a few episodes, but I, yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen letter Kenny okay. more, but my yeah. main takeaway from that is I don't take it as polite. I take it as, um, when they're done with something, it's like, all right, we're over it now. Everything's cool. Like you they, they have the exactly fist fight. Like that's the yeah. politeness I see is it's like they're yeah, yeah. even when, what was it? It was a uh, uh, joint boy uh, from letter Kenny. Like he, <laughs> he had a fight with him, And then afterwards they're best friends now, you know, after yeah, he beat him up. That's totally the way it is. No, no, no joke. No joke. Anyway. I'm just so glad I got I, to use the letter Kenny reference. <laughs> there we go. I have a buddy who will love that too. Good. Anyway. Um, Actually, what, what I have appreciated a lot or I learned to appreciate was the straightforwardness with which people, like when somebody had something on their mind, uh, I found my American friends in Japan were very straightforward. They'd just bring it up. You'd have a conversation about it. They weren't worried about hurting your feelings. They figured you were strong enough to be able to have a conversation about whatever they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I probably said a boot a couple of times and outed myself already. <laughs> and it's so. technically not a boot. It's a bout. It's, yes, it's, it, it, is, it is, but it sounds, I can hear it. I can hear it as I'm speaking to you. And I realize that, uh, this is totally, totally like labeling me. Anyway, <laughs> I can learn how to, how not to do it. So maybe I can be a, it, more incognito. Right? And also I'm from Wisconsin. It's like the worst accent in the world. <laughs> Um, and so you were doing, while you were there, I mean, you weren't doing art, but did you find um, influences while you were there? Or maybe you were doing um, art. I guess that's what I'd like to know. Well, I was a little demoralized, but then I, I went looking for Japanese hanga. I'd been a printmaker. So Japanese hanga is the, all the yukio stuff that you always see, the, the woodcut. And okay. I got in touch. I got in touch. Uh, my wife actually got me in touch with the Adachi Institute in Japan. And they've since w worked with Yayoi Kusama, and they've worked with Hunchavasser, they've worked with, uh, you know, they work with the Metropolitan in, in New York, and they invited me into their studio. Now, to be clear, I didn't work with them on a project, but they were very helpful with me. They let me see their, their carvers, their printers. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an open place for people. It's a place of business, and they deal with the cream of the crop famous people okay. and uh, they showed me some of the Hunterwasser work that they had they had actually printed for them and I just watched a Japanese special I think two years ago, ago where 
Yayoi Kusama was painting and printing with all the people that I worked with. So I was kind of like, wow, that's, I had no idea when I was there. It was, a, it was a very lucky find, and I only found it about six months before I left. They were very kind to hmm. open their doors and let me wander through. But how did you finally, like, was the, when you moved back, was it yeah. just kind of, I'm done here, my job's over? Like, was there a deadline, or um, when did you decide to come back? What, what actually happened was uh, I met who, the, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and has been for my, you know, since, since 2000. Um, she had applied for landed immigrant status. She lived in Vancouver for two years. And so she had applied for landed immigrant status, so she had to come back. And if she didn't come back, then she would lose her status as a landed immigrant. Okay. And I wasn't sure how things were going to go, and, and I thought, okay, I would love to stay more time in Japan, but why don't I go home and see how things go with her first? Mm-hmm. And uh, th- that led me to work, which made things more stable. We got married, and we've – like, I've been back, but I've never been – living back so what do you mean it's an awesome place though so like i've never gone back to live for uh, an extended period of time in japan so, you mean yeah yeah i lived there for two years just north of tokyo so. okay wow yeah and a small yeah it was awesome it i've was never been there well i've never been out of the states actually so that's that's really interesting to me like i can only imagine what it looks like if you've ever played the game sim city that's it was like a game of sim city gone crazy like you'd you'd drive around a corner and there'd be a building and then all of a sudden it would be torn down and then 3 days later there you know or a week later there'd be another building <laughs> like, and I, like the efficiency with which things are built and done in Japan blows my mind like i used to think things trains were okay here but now i know they suck <laughs> like compared to Japan or or even building. Like when a guy shows up to build something in Japan, it's done. Yeah. Like there's no there's no messing around. I'm coming back in a couple of days. It's like they hit it hard. It's done. And it's done right. You're not calling anybody to fix anything. So wow. Yeah. No, it's very efficient, I found in general. People just expect quality. You know, that's the thing. Like you hmm. like I they, people told me that clothes would be so expensive in Japan and I went looking at it and the clothes were a little expensive, but they were really well made. Like, hmm. you know, you just end up with, like, uh, amazing shirts. Like, there's no little threads or anything that comes off of it. Things that we just expect on products that we buy, Japanese people just wouldn't put up with. Uh, when I was there, you know, keep in mind, this was a long time ago. It was, like, okay. I'm 50 now, so it's, it was 2000 was the last time I was there. Okay. I, it doesn't feel like that long ago to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You blink and all of a sudden you're there. I know, So, man. And it, so then how did you end up getting, once you came back, how did you end up getting the mural thing? Like, had you done murals um, and then you ended up getting it in Brooklyn, of, of all places? No, so yeah, uh, it, it kind of went, I came back, I took a little time off from art, and then I started painting again. And uh, it was really hard to kind of find the right places to go. It was still, like, Toronto was really humming along with the, there, when I came back, there was a Queen West gallery scene. So that was the place. You would get your paintings together, go show a gallery dealer in Queen West in Toronto, and you would get a gallery and they would sell your work. Well, I tried and tried, and I'd get little shows here and there. Not a lot happened, but I, I kept moving along. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, I don't know why, about uh, 2013, I was involved with a uh, sort of a group show thing, and my work started to take off around that time. It just, I would sell things which I wasn't selling before that time. Hmm. I was having people contact me from galleries that they wanted to show my work. Um, I don't, I, I don't know why exactly, maybe street art kind of feel in my work or the Basquiat kind of feel of some of the stuff I do was more acceptable and, you know, less on the outs. Yeah. And uh, it's, I, I moved more into a career. And when that happened, my Instagram started to grow and people started to reach out with opportunities. Now, some of them were pretty crazy and some of them were like, you know, I just want a free painting. Um, yeah. But uh, one of the people who reached out to me was uh, Joe um, from the Bushwick Collective. He's one of the members and uh, he asked me to come and paint 
So, you know, and I showed up, I painted, it was my first mural ever, uh, with the help of a few friends up here who, you know, I, I've been painting my whole life, so I had a color sense, I know how to make a straight line, you know, I, I know how to design things or lay things down, um, and I just practiced an awful lot with the spray paint. It's still not, I'm still not perfect with it, but I'm, I'm pretty good now. You know, oh, I'm, so I'm you really hadn't even now. done spray paint at that point? Ever. Well, and, and to be fair, I could have showed up with just some paint cans and painted, and that mm -hmm. would have been fine with Joe. So, but I, I set a challenge for myself. So, so when did you yeah. the style of art that you have? When did you had you always been doing that uh, particular style? And how would you describe it, really? Um, um I kind of. Uh, all right, way way back when I was in my final year of university, I think it was uh, for my undergrad. I think it was 1994. I went to a retrospective at uh, the Whitney of Basquiat, and I walked in the room, and I was just stunned. So as I walked around, the freedom with which he'd been working um, really blew me away. And I started to look at that time at more abstracted artists like Cy Twombly and all, all the old school guys, and it just stayed with me in my head. Like, I'd always thought of myself as being somebody who had to paint more realistically. And all of a sudden, I saw this, and it, it really touched me. And I thought that's what I wanted to do more of. I wanted to move away from naturalism and what I was doing. So okay. I, I, I started to look at uh, this group of artists from um, Europe. They're called COBRA, Copen Copenhagen, Brussels. They're a coalition. They're... They're very, very communist, so they never caught on in the States exactly. Okay. Um, well, they, they're so communist that sometimes they even finished each other's paintings or their kids would work on their work and they didn't care. Huh. So they, were, they, they live in one big house and kind of live together and finish pieces. Carl Appel and uh, Pierre Alachinsky are two of their big um, uh, art stars. They made it big in New York uh, after their movement moved on. But I, I've, always, I've always been inspired by their kind of work. And uh, there's Jean Dubuffet, who's interested in, he's kind of like interested in early surrealism with, you know, whatever comes out of you, you know, automatic writing, automatic painting. And he, ins he I knew about his work in university, and it has always been my way of working in my head. Like, I'm, I'm more about representing the reality of what's going on inside you mm -hmm. or inside me than the physical world around me. So I, I, I think that's, that's where my influences come from. So when I paint, it's like an inner dialogue around emotions or ideas that are bouncing around in my head. So hmm. I, I, I also think, I, I also really believe by me being specific about me, I get at something I, – I, about you. It's, it's that we have a commonality that we reach by being honest. And, and I think that's what I try to do with my pieces. Hmm. So, and the, you said you were doing natural, more naturalistic type stuff before that. How, how uh, hard was it to adjust to, cause now what you do is very much, um, yeah. the opposite of that. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, it, it, it wasn't that hard to adjust. Uh, but I will say, you always have doubts. Um, I come from a small town, and growing up, you know, it's like, how good an artist are you? Well, how real does it look? Mm. And you always have that little voice in the back of your head saying, well, you know, maybe I should just go to portraits. And especially with, you know, a lot of people do that kind of thing. And I, I mean, but when I sit down to draw, it's, it doesn't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that I can't do it. I can do it. Um, I, I just, it's more painful for me. It's more of a strict, whereas this other thing feels more free. It feels more about myself yeah. and it feels more honest. One thing yeah. I love about, uh, what you do too, is you incorporate a lot of, uh, the background is words a lot of time, or you incorporate yes, words it in it. I love the way that you do your lettering. I, there's just something oh, about you. it. I really just oh, thank you. like it, it it's, it's so perfectly unperfect, if that explains yeah. anything. <laughs> well, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. Here, hold on for a second. I got, uh, there's a piece right beside me. So, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know if that, uh, you know, I, I like the quirkiness of it. I don't want perfection. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. When I'm working on stuff, it's like I'm working towards something, but I'm not sure what it is. But it's all about feel. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Sometimes a piece will have the, the feeling that it needs to be put aside for a while, and then I come back to it. Um, I'm working usually all the time. It's just sometimes more, I, I have more things on the go and other times I have less. Yeah. So, And also I thought of another thing when I was, cause you also incorporate, um, it would be outlines of what would be, and it's like an abstract person, person or an abstract shape. And actually yeah. I couldn't think of the name of this person. So I'm like, oh, I'm not going to bring it up. But I was like, Oh wait, this was a Canadian cartoonist. So maybe you'll know who I'm talking about. So there used to be this cartoon where it would be like a line going across the screen. And then out of that line, there'd be a person drawn and that would be the animation. Uh, I think you're talking about Ben Wicks. No, I I grew up with Ben Wicks. Uh, Yeah. You know what? As influenced as anything. Like, I mean, (laughs) my, my, I'm like, you know, how can you say if you've seen something and you liked it, how can you not say it can come into your work? Um, I like the flat outlines, the silhouette. I mm-hmm. like I like the space on my canvas to be kind of jumbled and flat. Um, I I haven't. My figures are like flat cutouts most of the time, and uh, they are about pattern and detail on them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're layers upon layers of cutouts, yeah. and you're revealing the layers underneath uh, from the left out shape. Yeah, because sometimes it will just be the implied what's going on in this shape and then other times it'll be the implied background and then you'll have like here's a facial expression like just yeah. in a random place on it i, re- I really I, I really do enjoy the the stuff that i was that i was seeing um oh well, thank you yeah and uh so you were doing your first mural how hard was it to do your first mural by the way did it did it just uh, it was like and it went perfectly or did it i mean uh, how do you uh, feel about it to sum up a very good friend of mine he said uh, before I went to do this, he said, uh, just understand, at every point in every wall I've ever done, there's a point where you think, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to finish this wall. Yeah. And he said, just understand, you, you'll probably have that thought. And I did have that thought. I did for the first two days. But my personal goal was I just kept working. Yeah. I just kept, you know, showing up, doing what I could do, and going home at the end of it. I, I realized that because I didn't have the experience of a lot of other people, I was going to have to push harder Hmm. and I had to fix a few mistakes, but honestly it it wasn't like I started at zero. Like when you're, when you've been an artist for as long as I had been before that point in time, um, it's just a matter of working with a new technique, which was the spray paint. And it wasn't like, it was more difficult, but it wasn't uh, an impossible thing once I got going. I figured out how to get everything I needed out of it. I'd also done a lot of work before I showed up at the wall. I'd painted some small things at my house, that oh, kind of right. stuff. That's... So I'd, I'd, been, I'd been working for a while. It wasn't out of nowhere. That makes sense. It didn't even occur to me. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, you could try yeah. something before you go. Duh. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> the, last, the last thing I wanted to do was show up and have this big wall in front of me. But uh, I'll tell you, the guys around me, they were very, very proficient with their, their tools. So they could do things that, uh, you know, if they've spent, I've spent 25 years painting on canvas, they've spent 25 years painting on walls. Mm-hmm. So they could get a lot more uh, a range of effects. They knew what to expect, how to fix problems. You know, and I've since learned an awful lot. I'm a, a lot better than I was on my first wall in 2017. But, um, you know, it's it, it was also a personal challenge. It was... I don't know how to do this. I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I often think sometimes we should do things we're afraid of. If it's not going to kill you, you should probably do the thing you're most afraid of because there's something to be learned in it. Uh, there's some growth that you can get for yourself. Yeah. What kind of thing so. did you learn from doing that? Like what were some things you took away from the experience? Um, I learned that I can do absolutely anything if I do my homework, if I'm willing to work hard enough, if I'm willing to embrace the possibility that it's not going to be perfect, that I might fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can move forward with any task. I can move forward with any plan. 
and that it's it, that people will help you too. There were so many kind people, you know, help me out, give me a little a little leg up, and uh, you know, but the support networks that I've met, like just the most awesome people in the world, you know. <laughs> Painting on the wall, guy beside me, Jeff uh, Jeff Henriquez. He's an awesome guy. He helped me out, you know. And his his girlfriend uh, Tina, they they were just the nicest people, kind of helping me through. And you know, there's other people in the collective like Joe. He was just willing to give me a chance, uh, you know, give me some paint. There's lots and lots of people. I can't even mention them all by name. Hmm. Who just showed up, had a nice conversation, give me a little word of advice, and it's like every place you go, you're learning a bit, you know. Yeah. So. And you've sold some, and you were saying that you've also been selling stuff. Like, how do you go about yeah. selling the things that you create along with being able to do these projects? Well, well, I, earlier it was galleries. Like, uh, when I was in graduate school in Montreal, I uh, made contact with a gallery, Gallery Pink Espace, and they show my work regularly. Um, in fact, I'm going to be involved next month with a, a show that they have um, going on. Uh, actually, uh, an animator is running the whole thing. Uh, the guy who is the, the uh, director and or producer of Caillou. And, uh, really? Like, really. <laughs> yeah, he collects my work. So Caillou and, and Arthur. And, oh, my uh, God. That's uh, super funny. Yeah, yeah, his first name is Ben. And uh, he has my work hanging in his house. He's been buying my work from way back. Wow. I, uh, yeah, which I find hilarious. That's great. But, and, they're, and they're very nice, and they invited me to be involved in the show. The title is Grumpy, and it's about about the negative energy around the COVID-19 pandemic. Makes sense. So uh, I'm putting some, some work together for that. Uh, I had a gallery in Toronto uh, for the past few years. It's just recently closed. Um, it's called Cold Stream. Um, I also I have a gallery that I'm affiliated with in New York uh, called Third Ethos, and it's, it's in Bushwick. So, uh, you know, Connie is a very cool person and she's the woman who runs the gallery and uh, she has some of my work and we talked back and forth. I was supposed to have a show before all the COVID stuff went nuts Mm -hmm. in the June when the COVID fell, you know, pulled everything apart and shut everything down. Yeah. So I'm hoping at some future date I can do that again. Um, I also, people, I post things a lot on Instagram and I find when there's a piece that resonates with somebody, they'll just reach out to me. They'll say, I want this one and I want that one. Um, I don't have a formal site at this point uh, where people purchase, but I, I think I think it's something I want to do in future. It's I'm not in a hurry. I don't know. I, I have a day job. I pay my bills. Right. A lot of what I, a lot of what I'm doing here. I don't think of myself as a, a hobbyist or an amateur, but I mean, I I just I also love what I do, so I want it to be what I feel comfortable with selling or uh, I. I, I I don't want to just be worrying about how much cash I need to get for each painting. You know, it's interesting. The, yeah. yeah Cause you are actively getting your stuff in places, but you're not, yep. you're, you're not selling it. I mean, you you are completely active. And first of all, how do you even meet all these people that you're, that you're mentioning? I'm, I'm pretty talkative. That's all I got to <laughs> say. <laughs> I mean, I know when I set up this thing for the interview, you were one of the first couple of people that signed up and I was super happy and surprised when people did sign up when I was just like, I'm just opening it up because I don't know who to talk to or if I'm afraid I'm going to miss people, but also it's really about reaching out. And I was kind of curious to see who would reach out. And uh, like I said, you were one of the first people. And plus it looks like you've been on other things as well. So yeah, how do you find these people and reach out to them? Uh, number one is I look for things that I think fit with my mindset, you know, like would I like to talk about my art and I don't know who you have contact with you. Maybe my next sale is going to be somebody who sees this, this podcast, right? You know what I mean? Like honestly and truthfully, I've had stuff like that happen or there's a gallery owner somewhere in your area who's looking for my type of work and they see it on your show. Mm -hmm. Like you don't know. I, I know this. When you do nothing, nothing happens. When you do something, something happens. You don't know what it is, and it's a momentum. Yeah. So I, I always look for opportunities. I try to keep my, my head in the game. I try to keep myself just pushing forward with creative projects, anything that interests me, or I, and I make time for it. Like you, you really have to 
career build along with making the work. Yeah. So it can't, it, it's like making the work is my calling and then my career is my hobby. Mm-hmm. That's the way I think of it. That all, and I absolutely agree with that too, but then like say someone was going to, someone else agreed with that and they were like, do you just do a Google search? Like (laughs) there's more to it than that as well. uh, It's okay. Number one is you put yourself on reasonable platforms, media platforms. You sign up for reasonable mailing lists, you know, like I've probably got three or four different mailing lists that send me opportunities Hmm. and I probably, and I pick through, I probably only apply for 2% you know, and I don't get everything I apply for. Uh, probably, I don't know. I, I, it's like, it's like, you know, the old Italian making spaghetti, you throw it all against the wall and you see what, sorry, my family's Italian and you see what, what drops, right. Right. You know, like, and I, I just, for me, it's try things because you don't know what's going to happen. It's like an adventure, but it's also with purpose. I've learned, like, my first two years, uh, actually, back to the 2013 thing, one of the things that changed was I said to myself, I don't know how to have an art career. And Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, then I'm going to do anything possible for the next two years, no matter how stupid I think it is. And I did. I showed everywhere. If somebody offered me a space on a wall and it was free, I took it. And... I mean, I did that for two years, and then after two years, I started being a little more thoughtful. I said, okay, hmm, I don't like showing at that place. Not going to show there anymore. Can't show here anymore. Here's what will work for me now. And I started to realize not only do you have to have a plan, that plan has to constantly be evolving because what works today won't work in two more days. You know, mm-hmm. you, you need to be reflective about what is happening, and you also need to be grateful. Like, None of this is a given. Like, if somebody buys your art piece, tell them thank you, you know? Be supportive of them, like, because there's no reason in the world for someone to buy a piece of art, honestly. Yeah. And if somebody enjoys your vision, then you need to give a little gratitude, give them something back. And uh, people have been very supportive of me. Yeah. I, I have far more really diehard collectors than I could have ever imagined. And very kind people as well. They've become friends. Yeah. So, and I feel like a lot of looking at your Instagram page, a lot of it too is really just having public pieces of work. There are so many, you've yeah. shared so many things of people taking a picture in front of something yeah. that you have out there, which by the way, one of them glows in the dark. Uh, she altered that. Oh, she okay. That. I was going to say, I, I did do a series of glow paintings though. A few years ago, I did a glow installation with transitioning light. So they were two different kinds of paintings with glow on and then glow off, but it cost me oh. a fortune. And I, I sold absolutely none of them during the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it happened. But you can so. at least say that you have glow in the dark paintings. So, <laughs> well, yes. And, and I also sold them a uh, majority of them later. Oh. So during the show, nothing a couple of years later, most of them are gone. That's the thing too, is when it's out there, you never know exactly when it's going to go or who it's going to resonate with, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen right away. No, I, I used to agonize about what I should paint so that people would buy it. And people would always say, Oh, paint landscapes or paint portraits. And, and I'm just like, you, you really have to paint something you believe in. And that's what people will buy. Yeah. Um, people don't buy art. They buy emotional connections. Hmm. So when they make an emotional connection with a piece that you made, that's the one they're going to buy. And it doesn't matter what it is, you know? And so if, if you try to gr- paint portraits of people, if there's no way for somebody to connect with what it is you're doing, your sales will be low, even if you're quite talented. But when you're able to let people make an emotional connection with what it is you're creating, yeah. they'll buy it and they'll come back and they'll buy more and more and more. Huh. So, and that's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it's the way it works. Like, you know, people will always tell you, oh, the market is this, make this, you know, it'll totally sell. And you end up with a bunch of stuff in your basement that you totally don't like. Yeah. All right. But when I've painted the stuff that I love, like I've, I'm almost out of stock at the moment. Hmm. Like I'm almost out of all my paintings that I've ever made. That's just crazy for me. What kind of stuff are you yeah. working on these days? Um, I've got a couple larger pieces that I'm working on. I'm working on stuff for the grumpy show. I also, I also do commissions now too. 
uh, I do them a little differently. And I, at first I thought nobody's ever going to go for this. Okay. But then, but they totally do. So I say, you pay half up front, you know, we agree on a price, What? and they give me some ideas or themes of things that they've liked from my work, and then um, they just trust with what I'm doing. And I've, I've done a few commissions, and I've never had an unhappy customer. What made I you just, decide I, to start doing that? Um, people were asking. They were asking for paintings, and I didn't have them. And I said, well, would you be comfortable with this? And they said, sure. And they tried it out, and I've never had anybody unhappy that I know of anyway. Wow. What types so, of things do they ask for? If, um, if I may ask. I guess the, the, well, this personal. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll usually send things like, oh, I really like that piece that you did with the smart. Okay. Here's an instance. Okay. I had one, one couple uh, have me work on a piece um, for an anniversary and, or a birthday, and they didn't like the smiles that I have going on in the piece. And then I had another person who asked me to paint just smiles. He loved the smiles that I have in my pieces, and he wanted one with lots of the happy, expressive piece uh, smiles. Huh. So, you know, I've had people um, – wh what I don't do is I don't recreate paintings. Mm -hmm. So I won't paint the same thing several times. I don't think it's fair to the collector. Like if somebody's, if somebody's on the ball, they jump in, like I'll paint in the range of – or I'll play with the same themes, yeah. but I, I, I won't make something exactly the same or very close. So that's the only rule I have. Wow. But, so and, and the commission thing came out of nowhere, and it's been pretty steady since. People just coming up with ideas, sizes, price ranges. They'll, oh, it, it actually usually starts something along this line. Somebody will say, uh, what's one of your big pieces worth? I'll tell them. Then they'll say, oh, that's too much for me. Do you ever do you have anything smaller? And I'll say I don't, but I can paint something for you smaller. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I have some people that I've met and made contacts with. They'll pay me a bit at a time. When they're finished giving me all the money, then they get the painting. You know, kind of deal. Hmm. And so, do you only deal in painted works, or do you ever do prints? I've done prints. Okay. I, 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 my background is printmaking. Right. Um, the, the one thing I don't like to do is do prints from paintings, um, okay. because. I feel like if somebody's purchased the image, I, even though I could do prints from paintings, I would like the person who purchased an image to, to enjoy that image as, as an owner. Um, I do a lot of drawing, though, so I often use my drawings as the ba as basis for my prints. Okay. So those I will use. And I, I try to addition judiciously, like, you know, maybe only 20 of, a, of an addition or... Maximum a hundred. Really, so they're harder to sell though. Yeah, they're harder to sell though. Okay. In, in my opinion, like people want to buy a print for five bucks. People don't want to buy a print for thirty bucks or twenty-five bucks. Uh -huh. um, you know, and I and I don't want prints done on garbage paper. It has to be on rag paper. It has to be uh, UV resistant. I want it to be uh, archival. Like I w I want somebody to have a really incredible experience from the print. Like I, I believe in materials lasting. I don't. I don't use crappy materials. I had an old instructor who he had a career, and he was doing quite well. Mm -hmm. And then his paintings started to fall apart. Really? And it ruined. It ruined his career. Yes. He went from being one of the top artists in Canada to not doing so well. And uh, <laughs> it was. It was totally because his paintings, like he, he they were really cool. He's an amazing artist. He knows how his stuff, but he just wasn't using the right materials. He'd use whatever he grabbed, you know? So I don't do that. As chaotic as my pieces look, they're always designed to last. Hmm. So. I guess I never put that kind of thought into it. I mean, it's just, I, I feel like it's just a given. That's so weird that you bring that up. It's like never thought twice always, about that. Although most of my no, stuff is digital, so it doesn't matter for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, no, it, it, it has to be, especially if it's a physical object. You don't want, like, one of the big ones is pigments. Like, many pigments do change with light. They just automatically do, especially reds and blues, depending on what you've got. And so you have to make sure you're using things that don't change drastically over time or things that don't change at all over time. Yeah. So, you know, and I use a, a few experimental materials in, in my work. 
uh, that I made sure last before I actually put them together. So what materials? Oh, secrets. Okay. I was, I was going to say, is this going to be some sort of secret sauce thing or can you no, say no, what no, it is? No, 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 no. Gotcha. It's not like that. I just, I, I've used drawing materials on my canvases before and you have to be careful. Things that are designed for drawing are not necessarily designed for uh, lasting on a canvas. Huh. So, but, I've, but I've, I've learned a few tricks. I know, you know, what to put with what. And uh, it's a little bit like mad scientist chemistry, mm. but uh, you figure it all out and, you know, you do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Okay. And you had mentioned before about how, you know, you adjust with things that you've tried and you have to learn to kind of adjust with what you know and what you learn. And then, of course, I realized as we were talking, it's like, and sometimes you have to adjust when the world decides that it's not going to let you do anything anymore. Um, yeah. And so I noticed in your uh, your Instagram profile or in your postings that you also did a virtual event, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I did a virtual event. Oh, it was probably uh, about three months ago now. It okay. was through um, one of the P groups that I made contact with was my local arts group. I'd never thought to reach out to them, but I had a friend who she, well, actually not a friend. She was, I taught her son at one point art and she really liked what I was doing. And she's an artist. She joined their council and recommended me. Oh. And so I, I got involved with all these events with them and they're very kind. And, and they invited me to do a virtual event with them. So it's the only one I've done. I'd like to do more at some point. Yeah, but, how did it I mean, go? What was the process? Um, it was, uh, they had me sign in on their account, and I just basically did a stu studio tour of stuff that I was working on um, from them. So, so You mean like they said, here's our login to our Instagram account or whatever they were using, and everybody got, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah so hmm. I could post, post and live stream direct from whatever was going on, right? Yeah. Well, and the other thing too, is you could create a specific account just for, sorry, I'm brainstorming now. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually really interesting because on top of that, if it's a business account, you can then have people just use the creator studio. Huh? Okay. That just made, there you, go. you just opened up my mind to a little bit of thought there. Huh? Interesting. Um, <laughs> That's and so you got a good experience from from all that. Like how? What was the? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I sold two paintings out of it. There you go. Okay. It's, it's like I it's like I said. I I finished up and uh, somebody immediately wanted to buy a painting afterwards. And then I was followed up by their husband contacted me and wanted to buy a painting. So it was just bang bang. I I was blown away. And they were pieces that I showed during the the uh live stream there you go so you know it, I'm, I'm always surprised by people who are like oh no i just do art and then i sit off by myself somewhere uh -huh. today's today's artist you have to be social your brand of social though you don't have to be uh crazy shaking hands with everybody yeah. you know but you do have to move in the world and uh, connect with people so yeah. it's it's like i used to think when I was in art school, I used to think you had to go in the room and meet the right person in the room. And now I believe you just have to go into the room and meet a couple of people every time you go out. If you meet two new people from every event you go to or every time you get a chance to talk to somebody, pretty soon you've got a massive group of people who know you're an artist. Hmm. You know, And it, it adds up and opportunities come out of that. It's a good point. Yeah. And, and that's true. I mean, it goes back to what you were saying before too, about just reaching out to people. And then once you know those people, much like yeah. when I meet people on here, it's like, I can just contact them again. I wish that I could talk to everybody all the time, but I can't just yeah. keep reaching out and going, Hey, what's happening? You know, it's it, yeah, cause no, then no. you become a nuisance. So, and I always feel bad when like time has gone by and I don't get a chance to talk to those people again. But when it does come up, I love being able to say, Oh, I know a person who would be perfect for this, or I need to ask some yep. advice from somebody. Yeah. Most people don't mind. I, I just, when I feel like reaching out, I do. And I found some wonderful help. Like there's some artists around here who are way more successful than myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been very healthy, helpful with business advice, um, you know, and very, very generous with their time. I find successful people tend to be very, open and kind as long as you're respectful of where they are and yeah. what they're willing to give you at a time and you're not you know mean or pushy 
um, people people like to share, you know, especially if they've got enough to share. If mm -hmm. they don't have much, they're a little more touchy, you know. Hmm. And there are there are people who I'm really connected with, and they're really nice people. And then there's a few people who don't like me at all, and that's fine too. You know, you just move on, find more of your own brand, and keep keep moving in that direction with those people because they will help you. They will come up with opportunities for you that you can't imagine for yourself. They will take care of your career better than you can. Yeah. And so I realized something um, earlier and I'm glad I just thought of it again because I wanted to bring it up. And even though it's probably the most obvious question and probably the most asked question that you have, fun. but so how did you come up with the name and why the two D's in it? <laughs> um, okay. It, it went something like this. Uh, I started... I was working with kids, and uh, they kept Googling my name, right? And there was a gallery I first showed with in Toronto um, called Swizzle Gallery, and they had this one show called The, uh, the Sp Spring Fever, and it was all about sex, and there were four artists chosen. Now, my stuff was suggestive stuff. You know, it was all kind of like – actually, I have a piece on the wall here I'll show you. Okay. Uh, it, it's from it, if you can see – they're up in the wall, the chicken. The, it, okay. Anyway, it's, it's suggestive and dirty, and that's actually a carving. That's back when I used to be more representational. Anyway, um, and the kids Googled this stuff, and the other artists who were in the show, the stuff was like, it was really raunchy. And the person had posted it on the gallery page, so forever it was locked into Google and my name. Mm. Uh, and I just thought, look, there's got to be an easier way to do this. I need a pseudonym or something. And... I came in contact with this guy who, uh, by the name of Christian Aldo, who would have group shows all the time, and it's kind of what got me working more regularly. And he said, so uh, what do you want me to call you? And I said, uh, Mr. H uh, Mr. Hyde. You know, I just thought it was a, it was the, it was a, a pseudonym. It was an alias. It was something a little dark. And uh, I was trying to hide from the kids. I thought it was funny. <laughs> and I put it up. I put it up. As, and when I first used it, the paintings in 2013 are all spelled H Y D E. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other hides, right? right. And Mr. Mr. Hides common because of the the novel. Yeah, I so, don't think you're the first person to think of it. <laughs> you got it. You got it. So I I also realized that by putting two D's in it, it made it more original. For me, for like email, things like that, it was easier to get a hold of. Uh, it also may be easier to find uh, on certain social media. And also DD is my my actual initials. Oh, so okay. It, 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 so for a lot of reasons, putting the two Ds in it made it make sense to me. That's complex, but it all works. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's when you're, you're standing there trying to explain to your boss why these kids have Googled this stuff and it wasn't my work it was other people's work and and it, i'm getting in crap for it so anyway yeah by association I, I just, yeah yeah totally by association i was like if i get a but but i gotta tell you the work was the other people the work was good that the other people put in but it was pretty graphic in places yeah like the the one the one person's uh art he did everything with food and and uh, sexual body parts and i said well and he would put them together Hmm. And so the, all the paintings were like penises, vaginas, breasts, uh, S&M stuff, and donuts and cake. And I'm like, well, okay. why, 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 are you, why are you so interested in this? He says, well, I really like sex and I really like food. So I just <laughs> put the food I'm like, okay, all right. Ask a silly question. Uh, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> So I actually uh, really love that answer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, actually, it was the best answer I got, actually. Oh, wow. So, and you don't remember who that person was? Because now I'm really uh, his curious. Name is, his name is Mark Ciel. Uh, M-A-R-K-C-I-E-L, I believe. So right. I I haven't ever shown with him since. It's it been not from any, not from being offended or anything. Right. Just, just I, haven't I, had I the opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, there's... A guy that showed in that show, uh, his, he goes by the name of Fresh Disco Porker Gas. Nice. And uh, he does these amazing, uh, very de detailed illustrations that harken back to the 70s. And they're very, very sexual. Huh. You shouldn't go looking for that work unless you're, you're looking to be surprised. But, uh, and he's an amazing artist. So 
And it's, it sounds like his is more of like the underground comics type thing. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. His, it's, it's like writhing forms, funny shapes, funny things happening. Mm-hmm. Like he's illustration based, but it's, it's this strange blend of comic and realism, but it's really good. Huh? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You just gave me a couple of things I got to search for after this. Um, there you go. And then uh, one more thing I want to ask is, is there anything coming up or anything you'd like to mention or talk about that maybe I, we didn't get to cover today that you'd like to mention to people? Um, uh, not, not exactly at the moment. I, uh, I tell you things have really slowed down because of the COVID, but, um, no, I, I, I think we've covered most, most things. I'm going to be involved in a show in Montreal in October. Uh, it's going to be the grumpy show. It's the one I mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, with, um, the sort of, uh, theme being around, uh, disgruntled feelings, uh, around COVID. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working mostly with that. That's uh, gallery pink. It's going to take place. Pink is boss in Montreal. Okay. Sorry. It's pink. It looks like pink E space. And the E space is all one word. It's how uh, it's a French word for space. Oh, they'll say like like a it's like this is the the gallery space. It's the espace. So okay, it makes it makes sense now that you say it. Like when you were telling me, like I don't know what that means, but that yeah, yeah. it actually makes yeah, yeah. sense when you explain it. And also, I'm not familiar. So, um, yeah. and then where can people go check you out? Where would you like to? Where can they check you um, out online? They can check out, uh, of course, my Instagram, uh, you know, at uh, Mr. Hyde uh, with two Ds, uh, underscore artist. Um, that's a good place to find me. And you can also find me at Mr. M-R-H-Y-D-D-E uh, uh, dot C-A. Um, or sorry, Mr. Hyde dot C-A with two Ds. All right. So easy place to find me. Great. And I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with me today. I'm so happy I got to meet you. Well, I'm glad I got to meet you too.